Hello, I'm Mihaela van der Schaar, and it is my great pleasure to give this invited talk in the ICML 2021 workshop on time series. Today, I'm going to talk about time series in healthcare, challenges, and some solutions. I would like to start with a big thanks to our research team, which has contributed a lot to this research agenda. William Osler, the father of modern medicine, said almost 100 years ago, if it were not for the great variability between individuals, medicine might as well be a science, not an art. And indeed, more than 100 years later, medicine continues to be more of an art rather than a science. So it is the goal of our research lab to develop cutting-edge machine learning methods to turn medicine from art to science, to go beyond precision medicine into what I call bespoke medicine, to empower healthcare professionals as well as patients, to develop more powerful systems, pathways, and processes in healthcare, to enhance population health and public health policies, as well as catalyze new discoveries. We know that patients are often complex. They have different genetic background, environmental exposures, lifestyles, histories and interventions. And this often translates into different risks, including different risks over time, variation in symptoms, health and disease trajectories, and responses to treatment. Currently, precision medicine, often called personalized medicine as well, fits the patient to a pattern, for instance, given genetic information. We would like to go one step further, though, in bespoke medicine by recognizing and adapting the changes in patterns with age, with lifestyle changes of the patient, with onset of new conditions, as well as progress in the course of treatment. How can we do all that? Using machine learning. So machine learning can enable us to get a comprehensive patient view, a long-term view that is changing depending on the current context of the patient as well as the history of this patient. It can provide a broad view that considers not only one risk at a time, but rather multiple competing risks and how they evolve over time, thereby providing analytics for a lifetime of care for a patient. And indeed, we have developed a variety of analytics to enable bespoke medicine. Today, I'm going to give as an example cancer because this is a very complex disease where we have developed a lot of analytics. However, the lessons learned from one particular disease can often be translated to other diseases. And indeed, we are working together with clinicians on many other diseases, including cystic fibrosis, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer, etc. And in order to provide bespoke medicine, we need to consider the evolution of a patient over time. So for that, time series are extremely important. But time series in medicine represent a multifaceted problem, which contains a variety of areas. And I'm going to discuss today these various facets of time series in healthcare. In the first part of the talk, I'm going to describe how we can tailor the development of time series models to healthcare challenges. And in the second part, I'm going to discuss how we can make time series models as useful as possible for clinicians and patients alike. If you are interested to hear more about this research of our group on time series in healthcare, I invite you to see our research pillar dedicated to time series on our website. Let me start by discussing how we can tailor the development of time series models to healthcare challenges. I'm going to start with dynamic forecasting. The focus here is to build disease progression models from electronic health tracker data. This will enable us to understand and model carefully the available data. Then we aim to learn the model parameters from the electronic health tracker data at training time. And at test time, we can issue then dynamic forecasts for the patient at hand on the basis of this model. We do not want just to issue dynamic forecasts that are accurate for the patient at hand. We also want to unravel new understandings of disease progression, 
at the population level, at the subgroup level, as well as at the personalized level. But doing so is difficult in medicine because the healthcare data contains multiple streams of measurements that are sparse, irregularly and informatively sampled. We are interested not only in forecasting one outcome, but multiple outcomes. And as different diseases are co-evolving, the outcomes may be changing over time. We also need to deal with the fact that true clinical states are unobservable. So for instance, the onset of a particular disease in a patient is unknown, and often the disease has been diagnosed much later. And also we need to deal with the heterogeneity of patients that may lead to many possible patterns from which we need to learn. So the goal is to develop data-driven, accurate and interpretable forecasting models. Currently, state-of-the-art in medical papers use Markov models. For instance, um, there is modeling of different types of diseases uh, as such Markov models where the disease is progressing across the different stages over time and the patient is absorbed in a at a particular moment in time. The absorbing state is, for instance, death. And the researchers are learning these transition probabilities. But an important disadvantage of such Markov models is they assume that the different disease stages are observed, and this is not often the case. And also they are modeling one disease at a time and also focus on the average patient. So for instance, the states and state transitions are, determining, are determined for the entire population rather than individualized for the patient at hand. More recently, hidden Markov models are often used in medical papers, and this already provides an advance because enable us to model uh, hidden unobservable disease states and how they evolve over time. And in this way, we are able to more comprehensively learn from the available healthcare data. And indeed, over the last decade, our own group has improved the agenda on hidden Markov models, looking at hidden semi-Markov models and hidden absorbing semi-Markov models, among others. But this is still not enough because the history of the patient matters, not only the previous states, but also the order of the states and the duration in the different states. Also, we do not want to have one size fits all models, population level models, but other models that are tailored for the patient at hand. Can we do that, for instance, using standard machine learning models for time series, such as recurrent neural networks? Well, we have two goals, as I mentioned before, when developing uh, longitudinal models for disease forecasting. We want to have on one hand accurate forecasting models that are tailored to the individual, but also we want to understand disease progression mechanisms. We want to understand the underlying latent structure of disease evolution. How many states is the particular patient passing through when developing a disease? And is this patient different than other patients? We also want to understand causal pathways and comorbidity networks. Patient subgroups understand temporal phenotypes. And we would like to also understand how the disease progression mechanisms are changing when we intervene on a particular patient, for instance, by um, taking a particular treatment. So what do deep learning models offer for this healthcare agenda? On one hand, we have observable models that have no latent structure. And as I mentioned before, we cannot learn very effectively from them. More recently, uh, models such as RETAIN have been developed for time series in healthcare. And this indeed provide interpretable predictions, but the latent structure is uninterpretable. Then on the other hand, models such as recurrent neural networks provide uninterpretable predictions as well as uninterpretable latent structures. Uh, 
So these deep learning models are not enough for healthcare because they do not provide us with both high quality forecasts over time, as well as interpretable um, models that can be understood by clinicians and medical researchers and hence are actionable. So for that, we have developed a few years back attentive state-space models, which are a general and versatile deprobabilistic model that is able to capture the complex non-stationary representations to able in order to uh, represent accurately patient-level trajectories. In the attentive state-space models, we combine the power and the interpretability of probabilistic uh, structures such as HMMs with the ability of recurrent neural networks to learn powerful representations to model state transition dynamics. And indeed, we are modeling the emission probabilities using probabilistic structures and learn the transition probabilities over time using attention mechanism in recurrent neural networks. And indeed, we are going beyond Markov models using our attentive state space model. We also go beyond current deep learning models because now the attention mechanism is not at the feature level, but rather on the states. So the attention weights are determining the influences of past state realization on future state transitions. And this is what we learn from data for every patient. And the attentive state space is able to repeatedly update the attention weight to focus on the past state. So we have in this way an interpretable um, latent state on the basis of which we can understand when the patient is transiting to a new state and how the history of this patient has mattered in this transition. These attention weights are able to create a soft version of a non-stationary variable order Markov model, where again, this underlying dynamics of a patient change over time based on the individual clinical context, both static information, such as genetic information, as well as a history of the patient, as well as treatments. In this way, attentive state space model represent a general versatile and clinical actionable models for time series in healthcare that generalize many other uh, models, including some of our own models, such as hidden semi-Markov models, hidden semi absorbing semi-Markov models, multitask recurrent neural networks, etc. And you may wonder why do we need such a general and versatile model for a clinical time series? The reason behind it is because we want to learn in a data-driven way um, the number of states the patients are passing through the transitions between these different states, how much the history has mattered for this particular disease and for this particular patient. And it may be that for a particular patient or a particular disease, history doesn't matter, for instance, or the duration in a particular state is extremely important in predicting future states. All of that needs to be learned on the basis of the data. And attentive state space model provides such a versatility. Let us now go one step further and look at time to event analysis and time series survival analysis. So in the dynamic deep heat work, which we have developed a few years back, we look at longitudinal survival data, where we not only have the history of the longitudinal measurements up to the current time, like in the previous work that I discussed, but we also have time to event information. So we know when different events of interest, for instance, different diseases have been diagnosed and the time at which they have been diagnosed. We also need to deal with right censoring because some patients, for some patients, we may not have information beyond the point. So our goal in this part of the research agenda is to estimate dynamic cumulative incident functions as shown in here. So we are looking at the current moment in time, um, what is the probability going forward for a particular event to happen at a particular time in the future tau. So we consider the longitudinal measurements accrued by the time of the risk prediction, 
while conditioning on the fact that the patient was alive at the time of the last measurement. So we are going to estimate dynamically the incident of the occurrence, the incidence of the occurrence of various types of future events while taking competing risks into account. In order to do that, we developed in dynamic deep heat a novel network architecture and associated loss functions. So we have recurrent neural networks with attention, but we are doing that in a multitask fashion where every task is associated with a different um, event or risk of interest. For instance, breast cancer and cardiovascular disease. So we have cost-specific subnetworks dedicated to these different diseases. Also, we need to develop more comprehensive loss functions than in the case of dynamic forecasting alone, because we need to consider time to event analysis as well as we need to rank the different uh, losses associated with different risks and different risks over time. And indeed, dynamic deep heat is able to issue dynamic survival predictions as new observations are collected over time. And you can see that here for two different types of patients, one patient that has died from breast cancer, and you can see how until the time of their death, the dynamic deep heat was able to adapt their predictions and time to event analysis for not only the key uh, concern and the key risk, breast cancer, but also for other competing risks, such as cardiovascular disease. And you can also see here another patient uh, and the predictions for them up to the time that the patient was right censored. We also have developed other machine learning models for dynamic survival analysis, including Bayesian non-parametric dynamic survivals, which are a different type of non-parametric machine learning method that extends the well-known BART method to dynamic survival models. Let us now look at how patients can evolve over time. So we are going to consider clustering and phenotyping in the time series setting. So how shall we group patients? Currently, the conventional notion of clustering and phenotyping is looking at similarities in time series observations using, for instance, autoencoders. And indeed, patients are clustered together based on the observations we have about them so far. However, this is not what is needed in medicine. What clinicians and patients need to know about patients is what types of events are going to happen in the future what type of adverse events, what type of, uh, for instance, recurrence may happen, or when in the future, different adverse events from competing risks may happen or death. So what we are interested in is a new notion of clustering or phenotyping over time, where patients are clustered together, not on the basis of the similarity of their observations, but rather the similarity of future outcomes. So when two patients are in the same temporal phenotype, we expect that they are going to have similar types of events over time. So we have developed for that a deep predictive clustering of disease progression in a paper that was published in last year ICML. And this provides a new notion of temporal phenotyping which is predictive of similar future outcomes and on the basis of which doctors and patients can actively plan. And the focus has been on learning discrete representation of past observations that best describe and best predict future events and outcomes of interest. So we have moved from the current notion of phenotyping that is focused on um, clustering together similar observation of patients into this much more powerful and actionable outcome-oriented temporal phenotyping, where we, are, for instance, observe that patients are together in a similar phenotype, depending on, for instance, their future risk of recurrence for breast cancer or side effects on, in terms of cardiovascular disease. And for that, we have developed a novel network architecture capable to cluster together uh, 
time series data on the basis of the outcomes. And we have trained these embeddings in a novel way using reinforcement learning, using an actor critic framework. Let us now go one step further and try to understand as a patient is, for instance, uh, having a particular disease, when should the patient be monitored subsequently? So we want to move from a one size fits all screening and monitoring setting uh, where the patients are all screened and monitored in the same way into a personalized setting using machine learning. And indeed we have developed a large variety of methods to determine who to screen, when to screen, and using what modality to screen. Today, I'm going to just highlight one of these works, but much more, uh, but we have done much more on this research agenda, and you can find that on our website. The work that I would like to highlight is called deep sensing, and the focus here is to do active sensing uh, using a novel machine learning method that we call multidirectional recurrent neural networks. And again, the understanding here is that monitoring and screening of patients is costly, not only in terms of monetary costs, but also costs in, for the patient. So for instance, certain types of uh, screening and intervention may be detrimental to the patient because they may provide radiation or may have side effects. So we need to have a trade-off between the value of information and the cost of sensing. So sensing needs to be not passive, but rather an active choice. Yet it is very challenging in the time series setting because we do not know the value of information and how this is changing over time. So this needs to be learned on the basis of the available data. So the key idea is that we use neural networks to learn at training time how to uh, build representations at different cost performance points. In this way, we create multiple representations associated with different measurements and costs. And each representation is learned recursively and adaptively by deliberately introducing missing data at different moments in time, such that we can model the different cost benefits trade-offs for different classes of patients, and hence the value of information at different moments in time as the patient is progressing. So what you see here in the deep sensing architecture is that at the training time, we learn these different representations and we can learn them using different types of models. For instance, the multidimensional recurrent neural network imputation method, which I'm going to describe later in this talk, but also other types of imputation models can be learned in order to learn representations at different cost benefits trade-offs. Then at runtime, depending on the characteristics of the patient so far, we, need, we determine on the basis of these trained representations, the value of information and the value of information over time, which will tell us when and which measure should be done for the patient at hand, thereby providing personalized monitoring and screening. Now let us discuss just very briefly about early diagnosis. One way in which we can determine diagnosis early, and this is important for diseases such as cancer, where early diagnosis would also lead to better and more effective treatment and potentially cure of cancer. We can learn from the available data, which may have patients that have been diagnosed at different stages of disease. For instance, here we have a patient that was diagnosed quite late with a stage three cancer. And we have uh, in the file of this particular patient, a few other observations, for instance, a few symptoms being diagnosed earlier and a few comorbidities being diagnosed. So we learn on the basis of the limited observations that we have about the patient, as well as the time and the staging of the diagnosis offline. And then using, for instance, models such as attentive state space model, we can learn for the um, uh, uh, trajectory of disease, as well as what symptoms and morbidities may precede the diagnosis of cancer. And then at test time, when we see, for instance, a particular set of symptoms for this type of patient, we can predict that cancer may be occurring, and hence we can screen more effectively this particular patient such that we can diagnose disease early. Let us now talk about treatments and treatments over time in this time series setting. 
So we have patients that have been diagnosed with a particular disease, for instance, breast cancer, and we have an entire history of the patient over time. And what we want to learn on the basis of electronic health record data is what's the best future treatment plan and determine causal inference models from such electronic health care record data. We can then estimate for every individual patient what is the best treatment course over time, how to treat a patient, when to give treatment, and when to stop treatment by computing counterfactual outcomes. This is not a simple prediction problem, like I described before, but rather a much more complex causal effect inference problem, where we need to learn on the basis of longitudinal observational data, causal effect inferences on the basis of only the factual outcomes that are available in the data. So we do not observe counterfactual, we only observe the factual outcomes given the treatment plans and the history of the patient. So this is a causal inference problem over time where we need to answer what if questions. This is very challenging in the time series setting. We have heard a lot in the literature, in the machine learning literature over the last years about causal effect inference in the static setting. But in the time series setting, this is a lot more challenging because we need to deal with time depending confounders, which bias the treatment assignment in the observational data set. And indeed, time-dependent confounders are very important in the healthcare setting. For instance, they are patient covariates that are affecting the past treatment, which then influence future treatments and outcomes. They may be, for instance, side effects due to a particular treatment. And indeed, we need to develop methods that are dealing with bias from time-dependent confounders. Early work for handling time-dependent confounding bias was developed in the form of marginal structural models that have been developed more than 20 years ago and are some of the workhorse on dealing with time-depending confounding in statistics. A few years back, we improved marginal structural models using powerful deep learning recurrent neural network models, thereby creating recurrent marginal structural models for estimating treatment effects over time. But both the marginal structural models as well as our recurrent marginal structural models suffer from numerical instability and high variance. Hence, we have developed a new way to deal with handling time-depending confounding bias for estimating treatment effects. And we do that by using a new type of representation learning in the form of counterfactual recurrent neural networks that are enabling us to balance the representations and thereby create treatment invariant representations. So for that, in our work on counterfactual recurrent neural network, we are uh, building a sequence-to-sequence -sequence architecture for estimating such treatment effects and computing such counterfactuals. For instance, we use the past information about the patient, inclusively a patient history that may include um, interventions that may, be, may have been made so far, and we are translating this using this sequence-to-sequence -sequence architecture into different new types of sequences, different translations associated with different types of interventions. So we are building counterfactual trajectories using this sequence-to-sequence -sequence architecture. However, unlike other areas where sequence-to-sequence -sequence architectures have been successfully applied, like for instance, translation or natural language processing, here we have an additional challenge. The fact that we need to deal with these confounding biases over time. So we are dealing with that by um, building treatment invariant representation using a novel way of doing domain adversarial training by improving on the work of Ganin et al. Let me now move to the second part of this talk, how we can make time series models as useful as possible for clinicians and patients alike. For that, I'm going to first talk about AutoML. So what is the challenge here? We have multiple models for predicting and forecasting time series models in healthcare. So we would like to understand what models is best to select at particular moment in time. How can we deal with temporal distribution shifts and risk factors changing over time. 
we cannot simply select by hand the best model to use, the best time series model to use at every moment in time. In order to come up with an automated machine learning framework that selects the best model at the current moment in time, depending on the time series data, we developed stepwise model selection, which is a machine learning model for sequence selection using deep kernel learning. And in order to do that, we have developed a novel Bayesian optimization algorithm that is able to tackle model selection over time. Unlike other work in automated machine learning for healthcare that focuses on the static setting, for instance, uh, our own model autoprognosis, which have developed for automated machine learning for static time series setting, there are many new challenges if you want to look at the time series setting where we need to select an optimal sequence over time. For instance, uh, if the objective is to um, model the performance at each time step, you may think that we can use a multi-objective Bayesian optimization, which is able to find one model that provides the best trade-off across all the possible objectives. However, MOBO is expensive to compute because of the large numbers of uh, observations and objectives that need to be measured at every moment in time. So can we have better solutions than MOBO? Well, one way in which you can think about solving this problem is by using multitask Bayesian optimization. And in this case, we can do better because we can do warm start through transferring knowledge gained from previous uh, Bayesian optimizations to new tasks, such that the, sequence, the subsequent optimizations are more efficient. And in this way, we can apply Bayesian optimization sequentially across time steps using multitasking. However, this type of approach is ineffective because it requires evaluating deep learning models on large data sets which is prohibitively expensive, and we need to do that over time. It also requires solving T separate Bayesian optimization procedures in a sequence. And it is unclear how to allocate effectively evaluations among these different sub problems, because that depends on the data and the data characteristics. Also, this does not take full advantage of the information across all the acquisition functions. So for this reason, we have developed um, this new model which is a hyperparameter optimization tool for sequence modeling, where we solve the multiple black box optimization problem jointly and effectively by learning and exploiting correlations across the Bayesian optimization functions using deep kernel learning. We are able to learn this jointly and effectively by using deep kernel learning, using deep sets, which are capable to create feature maps that are measuring the similarities between the different data tuples over time. Let us now look at another challenge in the time series setting, interpretability. A lot of work has happened on interpretability for static setting. However, uh, interpreting time series predictions in CalCare is really only in incipient stage. And at ICML 2021, we present a first model for explaining time series predictions in healthcare using dynamic masks. Please take a look at our paper. Also, we do not want to just uh, interpret models using, for instance, features and feature importance over time. We also want to do discoveries on the basis of this data and understand event data. A good example where this is extremely necessary is in building morbidity networks and comorbidity networks, where we can understand how, for instance, particular morbidities and comorbidities may trigger other morbidities over time. Current state-of-the-art modeling in healthcare is static and population level. So population level morbidity networks are built that uh, map at the population level the relationships between these different diseases at a static level. We have built personalized morbidity networks that are different for different patient classes, but also are dynamic. So it's not a static snapshot of the relationship between diseases, but also how these diseases evolve over time. And we have done that using a new machine learning model 
called deep diffusion processes, which is able to model the temporal relationship between disease onsets expressed through a dynamic graph that is learned using these deep diffusion processes. So in this way, we built dynamic comorbidity networks where the events are modeled as a multidimensional point process with an intensity function that's parameterized by the edge of the dynamic weighted graph that depends on the unique characteristics of the patient. We also want to issue not only interpretable and accurate predictions, but also issue uncertainty estimates associated with these predictions, such that the doctors and patients alike know when to trust these predictions and when they cannot. For that, we have developed sequential confidence intervals for recurrent neural networks. So predictive intervals that can be used for time series models of all sorts. In ICML last year, we developed a frequentist uncertainty in recurrent neural networks via blockwise influence functions. And in this uh, setting, we are computing uncertainty estimates by measuring the variability in the resample RNN outputs. And in this way, the RNN outputs are resampled by perturbing the model parameters through iterative deletion of blocks of data and retraining the model on the remaining data. Unlike previous work, whether it's Bayesian recurrent neural networks, quantile recurrent neural networks, or probabilistic recurrent neural networks, our approach is necessary and much uh, better for healthcare because we need post hoc applications of these uncertainty estimates that do not affect the model accuracy and do not interfere with the model training, such as, for instance, Bayesian neural networks. We also need to have a general and versatile model that does not require changes to model architecture and can be applied to a wide range of sequence prediction settings. Also, unlike in other areas in machine learning, in medicine, we do not just want credible intervals. We need frequentist coverage guarantees, which require formal frequentist procedures. So this is why this particular framework is especially important for determining uncertainty of time series models. Another important area in time series that I didn't discuss so far is missing data, inclusively informatively missing data. And indeed, some of our early work developed multidirectional recurrent neural networks where we are able to interpolate um, features over time as well as across features. So we are going to do imputation simultaneously across the different medical time series as well as across time. And indeed, this multidirectional recurrent neural network combines bidirectional neural networks with a new type of imputation. And because we are able to do dropout, we are able to do multiple imputations. So mRNN sequentially operates across streams as well as within streams. And unlike bidirectional RNNs, it enables us to do imputation in a causal way because we do not consider, we do not need to consider the future. We just use information that we have available so far for imputation. So the timing of inputs into the hidden layer is both lagged in the forward direction and advanced in the backwards direction. And in this way, the correlations are learned across the features using a fully connected network. And as I mentioned before, we can do multiple imputations, which is extremely important in healthcare, for instance, using dropout. But can we do better? Can we learn from clinical judgments? Because data is not missing at random. It is informatively missing. So we need to learn from time-varying sampling frequency. And indeed, clinical data is shaped by the clinical judgments. So we need to build probabilistic models for learning, not only from the value of the clinical data, but also the presence and absence of such information. And indeed, we have done that in an ICML paper a few years back, where we model a patient trajectory as a marked point process modulated by the health state. And we have learned on the basis of the nature of the uh, missing data more effectively. And we note that the nature of the informative sampling is healthcare problem dependent. For instance, 
cancer patients in a regular hospital wards are uh, measured differently. For instance, if the patient is deteriorating, we will have more observations than when the patient is doing well. And we can then build models where we are learning on the basis of this Uh, observations, inclusively missing data, and clinicians observe the patient's vital signs and lab tests according to a Hox process, which we are modeling directly. And Hox processes are double stochastic point processes that are able to capture the impact of the patient's health state on clinician sampling behavior. And we are using a Hox process with a self-triggering kernel that is able to capture the dependencies between observational events, thereby improving the performance of our predictive models. Another important area is the fact that we often do not have enough data available to build such analytics like the one I described now. And this is due to strict regulation of data access, which prohibits us access to healthcare data due to valid concerns regarding the privacy of this data. So in order to have access to this data, we can use synthetic data. And unlike the anonymized or anonymized data, which is real data with all personal identifiers removed, synthetic data is data created from scratch which cannot be synced back to any individual. And we need really synthetic data in the time series setting. The identifying data is often actually not very private. However, in order to create high quality synthetic data, we require new machine learning methods. And indeed, in ICML 2021, we have given a tutorial on generating synthetic data um, for healthcare. And an important focus of the tutorial was time series generation, where we aim to preserve the temporal dynamics by generating high quality synthetic time series data, which is able to capture the distributions of the features within each time point, as well as complex dynamics of those variables across time points. And uh, we have actually highlighted some of our earlier work on time series generative adversarial networks or time guns, which is a very powerful framework for synthetic data generation that lays at the intersection of multiple strands of research, gun-based methods for sequence generation, autoregressive models for sequence predictions, as well as time series representation learning. And what's interesting about time gun is it is able to handle mixed data setting both static and time series data. But time gun has some limitations. It is difficult to train and it has hard to evaluate quantitatively due to the absence of an explicit computable likelihood function and is vulnerable to training data memorization, which is especially challenging in the time series setting. So more recently, we developed another uh, model for time series data genera- synthetic time series data generation in healthcare called generative time series modeling with Fourier flows. And the focus of this is to generate model that enabling sample synthetic time series data while providing explicit likelihood models that are easy to optimize and easy to evaluate. Finally, we would like to build time series models that are reproducible. For that, we developed Clairvoyance, which is a unified end-to-end pipeline for clinical decision support. It is able to do predictions, forecasts, monitoring, as well as personalized treatment planning over time. The focus has been on reproducibility, so all the code for this is available, and you can play with it and augment it, as well as benchmark against it. And more recently, also, we are developing a comprehensive visualization tool for time series models, which can be used by clinicians and patients. Today, I described various methods to empower clinicians and patients for a variety of healthcare problems. However, these various problems are interconnected. So the next frontier is really looking at these problems, not one at a time, but rather jointly and understand how these different uh, problems interact and how we can build machine learning models that are able to transcend these different challenges. In this way, we are able to develop models that can enable bespoke medicine, empower healthcare and professionals, population health and public health policies, 
as well as better systems, pathways, and processes, catalyzing a revolution in healthcare. If you'd like to learn more about that or engage with us, I invite you to join our engagement session developed together with my students called Inspiration Exchange. Please subscribe on our website and join us in a future Inspiration Exchange session. Thank you very much.